Are you ready to ready to go over there, Oliver? If we if we get yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, 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 cool. We've got some people joining online as well. So welcome, welcome everyone joining online too. Um, and welcome everybody here to this uh, re research notes seminar hosted by the Resources Environment and Development Group at Crawford. Um, so my name is Simon West and I'm a lecturer in the Reed Group. Um, and just to get the seminar kicked off, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the unceded and sovereign lands of the Ngunnawal and Nambri peoples um, and pay my respects to Ngunnawal and Nambri elders past, present and emerging. Um, so today we're really honoured to have with us uh, Dr. Matt Allen and Oliver Lilford uh, joining online, um, who are going to present on their recent work on the historical assembly of Oceania's deep sea mining frontier. Um, so Oliver is an early career researcher um, and Pacific Studies graduate who completed his honours thesis on deep sea mining um, in the Pacific in 2021. Following that, he's held a graduate position in the former Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment. Um, he tutored with the Fenner School of Environment and Society at ANU and conducted independent research as well. Um, he's currently based out of Jakarta, um, which is why he joins us online today um, as a research intern for the Pacific Network on Globalization and also as a research officer in the Crawford School too. Um, Matt is a principal consultant at Sustinio um, and an honorary, honorary associate professor with the Reed Group at the Crawford School. Hey, how's it going? Um, he's a human geographer with over 25 years experience working in the Pacific Islands region, um, especially the Melanesian Pacific. So Matt was an ARC DECRA fellow from 2014 to 2017 um, and Professor of Development Studies at the University of the South Pacific from 2018 to 2020. Um, he's the author of books including Greed and Grievance, Ex-Militants Perspectives on the Conflict in the Solomon Islands, 1998 to 2003 and also resource extraction and contentious states mining and the politics of scale on the Pacific Islands. So the structure of the session is that Oliver and Matt will talk for about half an hour, 35 minutes or so, um, and then we'll open up for about 20, 25 minutes of discussion at the end. And a couple of housekeeping items before we start, um, we'll record the seminar and make it available on the Crawford YouTube channel afterwards uh, for people that can't make it, but we'll turn off the recording for the question and answer session after. Um, and also for people joining on Zoom, if you could just remember to keep your microphones on mute during the presentation, um, that'd be awesome. So with that, I'm going to hand over to, to you, Matt, and, and Oliver online. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, many thanks for the introduction, Simon. And um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see some familiar faces in, in the room. Um, yeah, so Oliver and I are really delighted to, to have this opportunity to share some of the research we've been doing on deep sea mining in the, in the Pacific. Um, and today's seminar is really based on a, on a chapter that um, we published earlier in the year in the Routledge Handbook of Global Land and Resource Grabbing. Um, and the genesis of that chapter really goes back to uh, 2019 when Oliver and I were both based in Suva in Fiji and both developed a keen interest in kind of oceans governance issues and deep sea mining uh, in particular. Um, you know, being the, the kind of hub of regionalism in the Pacific, um, we both had lots of opportunities when we we're in Suva to participate in workshops, seminars, other events, um, you know, looking at deep sea mining and also to engage directly with a number of the key actors that we'll be discussing um, in, in the seminar. And Oliver went on to uh, focus on deep sea mining um, for his ANU honors uh, thesis. So, you know, much of the kind of empirical material that we'll be presenting today comes from his thesis. Um, and important to note that Oliver is also the first, the first named author of, of the chapter. Our original ambition in, you know, writing a, a piece was that we saw there was, you know, there was a gap in the literature. There was really a need for an empirical piece that provides a kind of succinct overview of the history and current state of play um, with deep sea mining in, in the Pacific. Um, but the more we delved into it, you know, the, the more we were struck by the extent to which you know, deep sea mining really is a very rich space in which to um, think about some of the key concepts in, in resource anthropology and resource geography. 
um, such as resource making, materiality, um, and indeed the concept of the resource frontier. Um, and we're not the first to note that, you know, deep sea mining really is a, a quintessential resource frontier. So, so it's those lenses that we've brought um, to, to the story of the historical kind of assembly of the Pacific deep sea mining frontier. Um, but noting that, you know, theoretical and conce conceptual frameworks come and go, uh, we hope that if all else fails, the, you know, the, the empirical elements of, of the chapter uh, will, will remain useful to anyone who's, who's interested in um, knowing a bit more about, about the history of deep sea mining in the Pacific. Um, what I need to do here. I'll use this. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So this is the uh, overview of our, of our talk today. Um, I'll provide a quick overview of the argument um, and then I'll hand over to Oliver. We're going to be tag teaming a bit. So hopefully his um, internet connection in Jakarta holds up. Um, Oliver's going to talk about what is deep sea mining um, and then the current state of play with deep sea mining in the Pacific. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our conceptual framework. And then Oliver will take us through these kind of three distinct historical phases um, in the assembly of, of, the, of the frontier um, before, we, before we conclude. Okay, so, so recent years have seen a global rush to explore, enclose, and ultimately extract the mineral wealth of the deep sea bed. And these minerals include strategically important rare earth elements and critical energy transition minerals such as nickel, and, and, and cobalt. The value of these minerals, you know, is like estimates vary a lot, but all of the estimate, estimates are pretty eye-watering. Um, so the Guardian published an article earlier this year um, in which it was estimated that the value of just one of these mineral resources in one country's EZ in the Cook Islands at 10 trillion US dollars. So, so the the numbers are, are really eye-watering. The Pacific Ocean has long been at the forefront of the, of the global deep sea mining frontier. And, and the stakes are extremely high. The, you know, the deep sea miners, mining offers revenue for the Pacific's large ocean states, but it's likely that there will be severe um, and in some cases irreversible, irreversible impacts on biodiversity, uh, tuna fisheries, coastal livelihoods. And of course, um, deep sea mining imperils Pacific people's unique cultural connections to the ocean. We'll see that Pacific states are currently divided on deep sea mining and that there's growing civil society resistance, which is a key focus um, of, of our chapter. Industry proponents have consistently highlighted deep sea mining as a socially and environmentally benign alternative to terrestrial uh, mining to produce the minerals required for the fourth industrial revolution. So we provide a history of the ongoing assembly of the global deep sea mining frontier focus on the central role of the Pacific Ocean. Um, over three distinct periods, we trace the ways in which deep sea mining resources have teetered on the edge of becoming uh, resources um, <clears throat> and have been subject of intensifying struggles over their social construction. So the first phase has come from the 1960s to the early 1980s. And the focus during this, during this stage was very much on one type of uh, mineral deposit, um, so-called polymetallic poly -metal nodules in the area. And by the area, we mean the seabed beyond national jurisdictions, okay? And that accounts for about 40% of the seabed globally. There was then a shift in the 1980s to um, another type of mineral deposit, massive sulfides, um, which are more concentrated in EEZs and territorial waters. And then finally, from the early part of this century, there's been a distinct shift back towards nodules in the international uh, seabed, the area. We argue that struggles over the deep sea mining frontier have broadly mapped onto longstanding fault lines in the social construction of the ocean as described in a seminal book um, by, by Steinberg. So on the one hand, a Western capitalist construction of the ocean as placeless and asocial, 
and on the other, an indigenous Pacific construction of the ocean as social and placeful. But within that broad um, framing, each historical phase has also seen marked discursive shifts in how the main actors engaged in these struggles construct seabed minerals. And we show how these discursive inflections have been shaped not only by political, economic, regulatory, and techno-scientific conditions, but also by the material properties of the minerals themselves and the deep sea environments in which they occur. And the current phase has been especially informative in this sense. There's been a shift in industry rhetoric towards the inertness and lifelessness of the abyssal plains in which nodules occur, the greener technological processes involved in their exploitation and the pressing necessities of the global energy transition. Okay, so I'm gonna hand over to you, please, uh, Oliver. Yeah, of course. And I'm just gonna run through quickly what exactly deep sea mining can be considered. Um, we'll pass you back to Matt to give a, a more in-depth overview of the conceptual framing. Um, so deep sea mining, when we're talking about it, isn't really a singular industry, but a, a cluster of different potential and experimental industrial processes aimed at uh, exploiting these different um, types of mineral deposits on the seafloor. And it's generally thought to be depths of greater than 200 metres is the threshold. But most of the, the mineral deposits that we're talking about occur much, much deeper than that. Um, and so Matt's already talked about one, polymetallic nodules. Um, but the other two are cobalt-rich crusts and C4 massive sulphides. Um, these are the kind of the three that uh, types of deep sea minerals that everyone kind of tends to focus on. Um, and they all vary fairly enormously in their geology, their mineralogy, the associated biology, um, and obviously then demand very different approaches to extraction. Uh, and at different times and in different places, they've all been the subject of, of different levels of um, state and corporate interest. But crucially, commercial mining operations have never actually uh, taken place. We shift to the next slide. And so this just gives a, a, a little snapshot of the, the different um, mineral deposits and, and where they're located. Um, and so polymetallic nodules are these kind of potato sized accretions that sit on the abyssal plains floors, about 4,000 to 6,000 meters deep, so very, very deep. And their commercial interest kind of centers on the, the rare earth elements and the um, green energy transition metals that Matt mentioned, so nickel, copper, cobalt, um, distributed across the Pacific, but really outside of Pacific EEZ, it's really concentrated in an area called the clarion clipperton Fracture Zone, just south of Hawaii and um, towards Mexico, which are you know, much easier to visualize on a map coming up in a couple of slides, um, but just to point that out. And then cobalt-rich crusts are these kind of cobalt accretions forming on um, sea mounts and mid-ocean ridges between four and four, um, 400 and 4,000 meters. Um, and C4 massive sulfides, um, these highly mineralized deposits formed when heated seawater um, kind of rises up through the seafloor and creates these quite dramatic um, mineral stacks um, of, of formed by the superheated fluids. Um, their commercial interests differ slightly. It's more copper, gold, zinc, and silver. And there's just some images of the three different types. Um, next slide. And so when we're talking about how deep sea mining is governed, these different sort of experimental processes, when they're occurring within exclusive economic zones, um, it's entirely the purview of the state, um, governed by domestic mining legislation. But outside of those boundaries, um, outside of either EEZs or the extended continental shelf, which is also under national jurisdiction, anywhere beyond areas of national jurisdiction, the area, um, they're governed by a UN body called the International Seabed Authority, which was formed um, at the end of the uh, third UNCLOS um, negotiation, so the finalization of the UN law of the sea. Um, and the ISA really has quite wide ranging competences to license, regulate, and actually even engage in deep sea mining through an operational arm called the Enterprise, although um, that has yet to sort of develop. Um, but they're, they're really in charge of all the non-living material um, on the seabed. And so any um, company looking to mine in those areas beyond national jurisdiction um, have to acquire the sponsorship of a state, a party to the um, 
party to the arm clause and um and apply to the isa uh, in order to gain um, a license to first explore um and and later exploit and so the isa is only awarded exploration licenses at this stage um partly because that's the only regulations that they've developed um but we'll discuss this a little bit more uh, later next slide um and so really the pacific um because of the sort of concentrations of the three different types of deep sea minerals is considered the world's most prospective region um, for deep sea mining um, and just got a little arrow pointing there to the clarion clipperton zone um, it's kind of super abundance of of polymetallic nodules on the abyssal plains there and this is reflected really in the, in the number of licenses issued by the um, international seabed authority so 23 out of 31 are four areas in the pacific and most again of these licenses are for polymetallic nodules in that area um that's the clarion clipperton fracture zone next slide um and because of this i guess prospectivity um the pacific has played host to a number of world firsts regarding deep sea mining and this will come through um in the historical phases as well but it's worth just noting here that they've had the first domestic deep sea mining exploration licenses which was granted by the government of Papua New Guinea to a company called Nautilus Minerals in 1997. Um, they've had the first commercial deep sea mining lease um, for exploitation um, although the project never got off the ground and that was again awarded to Nautilus by the Papua New Guinea government in 2011. Um, although the company has now gone into liquidation since 2019 and there's this sort of high degree of uncertainty over um, what will happen to that mining lease. Um, they're also host to the first developing state to successfully sponsor an application for deep sea mining activities in the area. So Nauru partnered with um, the company Deep Green Metals, uh, which are now called the Metals Company, um, in 2011 to, to gain a license, an exploration license for the area. Um, and that's been followed by several states, um, Tonga in 2012, Kiribati in 2011, uh, 2015, sorry, and the Cook Islands um, with a separate company, um, a GSR, a Belgian company, since 2016. Next slide. Um, and so at the state level, there's this division, um, quite stark division on uh, among states around um, who is for deep sea mining and who really is Quite against it. Um, and so Nauru, Cook Islands, Tonga and Kiribati understandably have all been sort of quite vocal proponents of, of deep sea mining, um, very vocal proponents. Um, but there's a gathering coalition of, of states um, forming their own sort of different alliances um, and with varying degrees of againstness um, for deep sea mining, uh, whether it's calling for a pause or a moratorium or an outright ban. Um, so the MSG member states, French Polynesia, um, French Polynesian Assembly, New Zealand, um, the Federal Trade States, Macronesia, Palaus, Samoa, um, Vanuatu, and I haven't put the Fiji on there as well. Um, really interestingly, Australia has been a bit of a notable silence in this um, in this debate. Um, and it, it somewhat goes without saying that there's a very strong Pan Pacific. Um, movement contesting deep sea mining uh, with a really, really diverse coalition of actors, including churches, civil society organizations, NGOs, politicians, um, public servants, academics, artists, and, and more coming together um, and, and really trying to speak out against um, what they see as the, this presumed legitimacy of, of deep sea mining in the region and really sort of pushing for it to be banned. Um, and they, they articulate with, um, diverse global networks of anti-deep sea mining actors and movements as well. Um, so the really strong anti-deep sea mining um, network at the at the um, CSO level. Next slide. Okay. I'll pass so back to Matt here. Yeah, I'm going to jump back in now to yeah, just talk a little bit more about our um, conceptual um, framework. Um, so as I flagged at, at the outset, we, we're really keen to engage in some key concepts in, in resource geography and resource anthropology, including resource making, and very much inspired here by the seminal work of, of Karen Baker and Gavin Bridge. Um, so a, a natural resource is 
a relational and fluid category, a particular nat natural substance or material only becomes a resource when society makes it so. And just as society can make resources, um, so can it unmake them. Um, and resources really move along a continuum of resource-ness. Um, another key insight from, from this literature is that the biophysical and geological properties of non-human substances can shape the political, economic, and techno-scientific processes by which they move along this continuum of resourceness. So, so in short, materiality uh, matters. And then we're very much engaging with this concept of the resource frontier, um, again, following the seminal work of, of Anna Singh and Tanya Lee. Um, so frontiers are uh, uh, you know, conceived as spaces where the human and non-human interact and social actors compete for power and authority in the reordering of institutions and the production of new patterns of resource access and control. And frontiers are assembled through law and policy making, the production of technical and scientific knowledge, investment and financing, and the discursive strategies of the actors that compete over them, all of which are also subject to the agency of the non-human world, including but not limited to that of the substance that is the subject of these efforts. So again, materiality matters in this, in this framing of, of resource frontiers. I think we'll see as, as we go through the historical phases that the, the DSM frontier has also been a striking tale of the economy of appearances and of spectacular accumulation, again, going back to some of Anna Singh's work. We found um, some striking resonances with um, Korg Karma's work on the resourcing of the resource making contra controversies that have ensnared unconventional fossil fuels. And, and Karma introduces the concept of a liminal resource, a substance whose resourceness is still in the process of being assembled. And we found this a, a pretty useful lens to, to bring to this story um, at different times and in different places, particular seabed mineral deposits have come close to becoming resources, but their resourceness has remained provisional and the frontier remains to be fully assembled. Palmer also introduces a concept of ontological politics, which again we found useful because it really foregrounds the material discursive and performative dimensions of resource making. It's important to note that there, there is an emerging um, body of work on, on deep sea mining, including focus on the Pacific that has drawn upon um, some of these you know, key concepts in, in resource geography and resource anthropology. So there's been great work done on the geopolitics of regulation in the area. Uh, there's been work done on the role of materiality in the discourses of DSM firms and resistance groups in the case of the Saltwater One project in PNG. And like a special shout out actually to the work of John Childs, um, because he, I guess he was the first to, to really flag the importance of, of materiality um, in these struggles. And, and in many ways, our, our chapter kind of extends Childs's work, you know, from Saltwater One um, back out into, into the area and, and, and in the case of, of poly, polymetal, polymetallic nodules. Um, there's been work done on the unpredict, unpredictable interactions between different actor networks in the unraveling of the Saltwater One project. There's been work, um, uh, you know, pushing pushing the focus on state-led territorialization to consider the shifting temporalities of deep sea resource making. Um, and there's also been work done by Sparenberg on the open-ended, reversible, and sometimes incomplete process of resource making demonstrated by the history of nodules and the UNCLOS negotiations. So I'm going to um, hand back to Oliver now to uh, yeah to take us through through the three phases. Thanks, Matt. Um, so just yeah, as Matt flagged, flagged earlier, we kind of chart these three distinct historical phases beginning the sort of mid 20th century um, up until the end of UNCLOS 3, um, which ended in 1982. And this kind of post-UNCLOS phase where there's this shift to C4 massive sulfides in the exclusive economic zones of Pacific states and territories. 
and then this again shift back out to the nodules um, in the early 21st century, sort of towards the end of the 20, um, start of the 2010s. Um, so beginning, oh sorry, next, I'll try to click myself, sorry. <laughs> so phase one, the nodules in the area. So following World War II, there was this really deep interest in um, the, the, the deep seabed um, as a potential source of valuable and again strategically important minerals like nickel, copper and cobalt. Um, really, really sort of helped along by emerging technologies in um, extraction, extraction on the seabed through um, from oil and gas. Um, and technologies for actually visualizing the deep seabed um, and bringing that those kind of resources into focus um, through like mineralogical assessments. Um, and these articulated with uh, perceived anxieties over the supply chains of minerals, um, those strategically important minerals among industrialized states and a commodities boom across the 1960s and 70s. Um, and so you had this, these conditions uh, for the sort of growing interest um, in, in the deep seabed and in nodules in particular because of their, their, their mineral um, affordances. Uh, next slide. And so as a result, between the late 1960s and early 1980s, there were several multinational uh, consortia formed involving branches of the global arms and oil industries, including Lockheed Martin, um, as well as national oceanographic institutions um, and agencies from uh, industrialized states and often working in tandem, sort of bringing, <clears throat> seeking to bring nodules into commercial production by conducting hundreds and hundreds of research cruises to try and visualize um, uh, like quantify and qualify the economic geology of those nodules, their distribution, density, chemical and mineralogical compositions, mm -hmm. and the topographical context, um, as well as also experiments in developing and testing commercial module recovery systems. And because of all of these activities, um, they came to be sort of entangled in questions over who really had control um, over the rights to access and close and exploit these seabeds um, out in the high seas, um, but the concept of the high seas doesn't exi exist yet, but out in the sort of deep ocean. Um, and there were calls being made um, at the time in response to this, um, in response to this kind of what was being seen as a colonial style scramble for the seabed um, to, to recognize the deep ocean seabed and the resources as the common heritage of humankind. Um, and this kind of really kick-started the UNCLOS three negotiations in 1972. And as a result, DC mining really did dominated um, UNCLOS three um, over that decade. Um, and and uh, questions over who had um, controlled the rights to access and close were really dominant um, during those negotiations. Um, and UNCLOS three did end up codifying um, the common heritage of humankind and trying to sort of organize efforts to, um, so efforts to organize uh, mining along redistributive lines between the global north and the global south. Um, but at no point really were, during the negotiations was uh, the question of whether to mine um, the seaboard bed or not really given any sort of due consideration. Um, and as such, uh, Ranganathan in 2019 talks about um, how UNCLOS really constructed the seabed as a series of extraction sites above all else and enshrined a particular extractive imaginary um, that really presupposes the questions of whether to mine. Um, and this really relies on the material conditions imagined um, of the seabed that as disembedded from society, socioculturally, but economically and ecologically too. Um, next slide. And so, at the end of UNCLOS 3, um, there was this there was sort of changes to what are called the nature and affordances of nodules. Um, so as they were brought into greater resolution, there was actually a sort of really dramatic reduction in um, the value uh, assigned to um, the, the nodules and the minerals that they contained um, and a reduction therefore in, in nodule exploration activities, um, as well as barriers to the technical feasibility of actual mining um, and changing economic conditions as the value of the minerals themselves um, on, the, on the global market continue to drop. Um, but 
nevertheless, you know, um, nodules remained at the threshold of, of resource ship. Um, their resourceness was still sort of in, in the process of being assembled, but not quite so uh, intensely. Um, and nodules featured really significantly in international negotiations over the protections of corporate knowledge that have been built up over the course of these um, exploration cruises and um, testings of nodule recovery systems. Um, uh, those international negotiations over the, the legal regime. Um, and there was also this kind of great dissatisfaction with the the legal regime as a whole that had sort of come at the end of um, UNCLOS 3, a dissatisfaction among industrialized states that uh, wasn't sort of a, a big enough nod to um, free market and the ability for industrialized states to sort of and their corporations to sort of do what they wanted, um, as it were, on the seabed. Um, and resource making efforts, though, in general, didn't really dissipate, um, but came to focus on on other, at this point, really, at, until this point, unknown geophysical phenomena. So cobalt rich crust, but especially C4 massive sulfides. Next slide. <clears throat> um, and part of this was the reason. Um, for this, sorry, uh, was caught up in the reasons that nodules had become less interesting. Um, so these um, C4 massive sulfides were generally found in the exclusive economic zones of Pacific countries and territories, um, not only in shallower water, making them technically uh, more feasible to mine, <clears throat> but also in more attractive legal regimes. So they fell in with domestic legislation rather than the UNCLOS regime. Um, yeah, this is, sorry, the deep seabed um, regime governed by the International Seabed Authority. And on top of this, um, newly independent or in the process of decolonization at the time, um, these states really gave departing, cop um, departing colonial powers the opportunity to link the efforts to explore and try to ultimately exploit C4 massive sulfides um, and cobalt rich crust resources, um, link them to narratives of economic development. And so at this point, you have the formation of the committee, the coordination of the joint prospecting for mineral resources in the South Pacific offshore areas, which is an absolute mouthful, um, but later becomes the South Pacific Applied Geoscience Commission. Um, and that subsequently, be, subsequently becomes the Geoscience and Energy, Geoscience Energy and Marine Division in the South, in the Pacific community. Um, so a research body sought to promote geophysical research on marine shelves, so oil, gas, and deep sea minerals, um, on the marine shelves of, of Pacific states and within their EEZs. Um, and the SOPAC really facilitated a, a quite a huge number of cruises, um, which in the reports produced were extremely successful in confirming the resource potential um, of the Pacific uh, region. Um, I guess this points to the, the importance here of assembling that knowledge of 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 the seabed in order to bring it into greater resolution and, and enhance the, the possibility, the desirability and um, feasibility of, of mining. Um, and obviously this um, uh, these activities really attracted um, the interest of, of corporate actors, but there was also a sort of an active cultivation of that interest as well um, to try and bring um, corporate actors into the scene. Sorry, next slide. Um, and as right in, Around 1991, there was the discovery, um, one of these cruises of a Bonanza um, C4 massive sulfide ore body in PNG. And that really saw the emergence um, of, of what became a really uh, intense uh, collection of efforts to try and bring um, C4 massive sulfides into commercial production, beginning with this company, Nautilus um, Minerals um, Inc. In, in Nineteen ninety three, when they have filed for their first license for this over this <clears throat> ore body, um, which at the time no Pacific states, including PNG, had any policies or legislation or regulations specifically related to offshore um, mineral exploration. So underneath um, PNG's extinct um, uh, land mining act, they were granted a, a license in nineteen ninety seven, um, and then began to really sort of export that that uh, process out to other parts of the Pacific. Um, this attracted other actors at the same time, and they began to accrue really quite vast areas of exploration tenements across Tonga, Vanuatu, Fiji, Solomon Islands, um, and other jurisdictions. 
and by 2010 alone, um, Nautilus, Nautilus's exploration elements alone, um, really were sort of vast, exceeding 600,000 square kilometers. Um, so huge areas. Uh, and at this time, Nautilus went through what can be described as a, a period of spectacular accumulation. It's important to note as, as mining juniors, um, these emerging deep sea companies like deep sea mineral had sort of little capacity to independently assess the Pacific seabed and so they, um, to make their licensing claim. So they relied upon um, that seabed data from SOPAC, um, but also had to sort of produce their own maps, reports, tables and charts and technical visualizations of the seabed to try and um, like really promote um, their, their visions of what uh, would, would be these novel mining deposits and whole new methods of mining to inspire significant investments they needed to drill the market in the search of capital. Um, and that they, they did manage to drill the market quite successfully and CEO of um, uh, Nautilus Minerals, David Hayden, had by 2008 really turned nothing more than a few promising core samples into 360 million US dollars of, public, um, of capital. And there's just a little overview of the tenements um, geographical spread from Nautilus. Uh, next slide. Um, so these really intensive resource making efforts also included, as we're talking about, um, uh, they kind of mobilized specific materialities of the deep sea. Um, it's explored more deeply by Charles, but they, you know, these discursive efforts took place across annual reports, environmental impact statements, stakeholder con consultations, all in an effort to kind of promote the desirability and um, sustainability of, of, of mining C4 massive sulfides. And these really center on the deep sea's remoteness from society. Um, in the case of, of Solwara 1, this project in Papua New Guinea, it's dynamism next to an active volcano, the constant shifting, changing thing to sort of um, uh, juxtapose mining activities next to these massive natural um, tumult, and um, as well as the minimal spatial and temporal fitment, uh, footprints of the proposed mining activity. It's really marked an important shift, an enduring shift as well, in the way that deep sea mining proponents sought to make mining both viable and desirable by making it seem sustainable both environmentally as well as socio and culturally by being distinct and disembedded from society. So it also resulted as saw before, these very high new levels of interest in testing the viability and desirability of deep sea mining, but also controversy. Yeah, next slide. And at the sort of um, rise of Nautilus is also the rise of, of a sustained um, Pacific movement against deep sea mining, um, beginning in 2008 with the Bismarck Solomon Sea Indigenous Peoples Council. Um, and they began mobilizing in, in um, distinct kind of um, opposition to the framing um, put forward by Nautilus and others, um, at their own distinct framing um, of the ocean and their relation to it, um, in which the seabed is inextricably woven into the fabric of their cosmology and their social life, um, in order to really sort of dispel aim, uh, claims that the seabed is separate from society and um, asocial. And these arguments were sort of taken up alongside a, a emerging scientific critiques of deep sea mining um, and this growing coalition of actors speaking out in different local, national, regional, and, and even global constituencies. Um, for example, the deep sea mining campaign, which was an alliance of NGOs, civil societies, and individuals from Pacific, Australia, Canada, and the US. Um, next slide. So as all of this was going on, there was uh, a sort of build up um, of interest in, in nodules again over the early 21st century. Um, and these, you know, the, the conditions were really echoing those well historical conditions of the 1970s. Um, growing interest in, in the strategic minerals, um, commodities boom. Um, and it kind of really is marked by uh, this moment that David Hayden, the CEO of Nautilus, establishes two wholly owned subsidiaries of Nautilus. Um, and then, uh, sorry, Nauru Ocean Resources Incorporated, Nori, um, and Tonga Offshore Mining Limited. Um, 
specifically with the aim to gain sponsorship from um, developing states to uh, gain um, uh, apply for licenses in the area. Um, and he forms his own company, Deep Green um, uh, Minerals Limited, and um, takes over the Nori and Tommel um, in order to then uh, pursue pursue that uh, goal. And all of this is also happening. Um, you have SOPAC, who has sort of uh, produced all of this, um, these technical visualizations of the seabed and encouraged this activity, um, is seeing this rush to uh, uh, ongoing rush for a C4 massive sulfide exploration tenements, as well as this emerging sponsorship um, from Nauru and Tonga. Um, and they strengthen calls for a regional approach to regulation. Um, and in 2011, they secured the support of the EU to develop the SPC EU um, uh, deep sea mining project. So in, in the sort of assembling of, of the frontier, the deep sea um, SPC EU deep sea mining project is really quite significant, um, aimed at approving, uh, imp uh, um, improving deep sea Pacific countries, governance and management of deep sea minerals in accordance with international law. Um, but really sort of sets out to make a stable, clear and consistent regional framework, which might encourage um, the development and investment in, in deep sea mining. Um, and so they developed the um, uh, regional legal regulatory framework, um, the RLRF, and this is followed by a rapid proliferation of domestic deep sea mining legislation, which all sort of expressly seek to fulfill state obligations under international law. Um, uh, to sponsor um, mining activities in the area, or at least at this point, exploration activities. And it's really be seen as a clear example of governments and industry really seeking to delineate specific pathways to exploitation. And so it doesn't sort of openly advocate for specific governments to participate in deep sea mining, but plays a really crucial role in, in providing these kind of facilitative services um, that construct deep sea minerals and in particular nodules in this case is this growing interest in deep sea in um, polymetallic nodules in the area as a resources with the potential for exploitation um, and, and also a sort of desirability for exploitation. Um, and those act these efforts really then get built on and extended by um, industry actors like Deep Green um, who also participated in, in this project. Next slide. Um, so you sort of see this at the same time, this scale jump up back out to the area, this really um, uh, scale jump in, in the way that uh, actors like Deep Green began to really push that narrative to sustainability that sort of emerged from Nautilus um, and framing deep sea mining as, as necessary and particularly mining nodules as necessary. Um, for meeting the projected demand for minerals um, and re required for the green transition. Um, and so they invoke uh, climate change in this instance to kind of create this, this temporal um, uh, like imperative for, for mining. Um, and these narratives coalesce around deep sea, deep green's efforts to construct um, nodules as batteries in a rock that will power the world's green economy and the shift to renewables. And they really they recycle out these arguments from Nautilus, but they they're scripted with with reference to specific materialities of nodules. So they really emphasise the remoteness of nodules um, and their bristle planes and their enormity in the context of world environments. Um, they can't, they really emphasise the inertness of this environment, its lifelessness, um, and also the concentration of these metals um, and their position sitting on the seafloor. And they use this to um, to really enhance these, um, to give weight to the, the the softened language that they use to describe their future extractive activities. They don't mine, but rather they deftly collect, or gather, or harvest, or simply pick up um, nodules from the seafloor. It's a nice little uh, graphic from from their website. Um, uh, next slide. Um, and in, in the midst of all of this um, is also an attempt to sort of undergo uh, the similar kind of processes of spectacular accumulation that, um, that Nautilus um, sought to achieve. 
um, and in, in 2021, um, sort of aided by the fact that the president of Nauru, Lionel Angamaya, um, triggered this obscure clause in the law of the sea, Article 15, the so-called two-year rule, which sets a deadline um, for the exploit uh, for the International Seabed Authority to finalise exploitation regulations in the area. Um, after which, uh, supposedly, the ISA Council must accept and consider any application to commence mining under whatever regulations are available at the time. Um, or on this a little bit later, but it was significant at the time because Deep Green um, was seeking to undergo a merger that would see it become listed on the New York Stock Exchange um, as the metals company. Um, and uh, th this was all premised on their claim that they could start mining um, the world's largest and highest grade estimated source of battery metals as soon as um, 2024. And underpinning this was um, the, the sort of legal guarantee um, that they would be able to do so thanks to Nauru's um, triggering of the clause. Um, and it's, it's worth noting that at, at the time, the company, um, the capital sort of value, uh, well, what they were seeking um, in terms of market capitalization was about three billion um, US dollars. Um, of course, it's important to note that Nauru firmly rejects any assertion of the decision to trigger this clause with anything but their own. Um, next slide. We've got um, 10 minutes left. Of the okay, we've got 10 minutes oh, left. Oh, sorry. All of us, so yeah, maybe. If, I'll, I'll run through these very quickly. Okay, sorry. Um, so in, in parallel to the, the growing um, growth of deep sea mining companies and SOPAC's efforts to sort of scale their resource making efforts um, and efforts to regulate those, so too have uh, those resisting deep sea mining. Uh, mentioned they operate across local, national, regional, and global scales. Um, and they've consistently sought to disrupt the presumed legitimacy of this. And it's really um, sort of politicized the assembly of the process and really created new spaces and scales like a, at a regional scale um, for contesting deep sea mining. Um, and I think it provides a really clear example of what um, Katarina Teawa describes as critical oceanic regionalism, um, which is really, uh, really interesting and really important kind of resistance to this. Next slide. Um, and at the moment, it's kind of coalescing in, in the Pacific around this idea of drawing the Pacific blue line and asserting this oceanic identity as custodians of the Pacific Ocean against um, those who would seek uh, to um, exploit it. Um, and uh, it really invokes that deep history of collective Pacific action um, and makes this link to, between deep sea mining and nuclear colonialism um, by calling for the Pacific not to become a testing ground for unproven technology. And it really mobilizes um, the material of the ocean as this vast, fluid and interconnected um, space to, uh, to contest some of those narratives of um, um, separation and um, the asocial nature of the, the seabed pushed forward by um, uh, Deep Green and others. And it really sits in perfect tension with that future oriented norm of claims of responsibility and obligation that Deep Green mobilizes in order to um, promote this idea of, of deep sea mining as being the, the fix um, for climate change. Uh, next slide. Um, and so where are we now? The timeline for the two year rule came up in July this year um, and members negotiated an agreement to finalize regulations um, in July, 2025. Um, which is not a legally binding timeline. Um, so the companies can now technically apply, um, but it's much more difficult for those um, mining licenses to be approved, um, which is not really what Deep Green or Nauru wanted. Um, but nevertheless, you have people like Gerard Barron, who's the um, metals company CEO, quote saying, um, it is now a question of when rather than if commercial scale nodule um, collection uh, uh, will begin. Um, you've had several prominent mining companies begin trials, prototype mining vehicles. There's this ongoing uncertainty over domestic deep sea mining in PNG over the Sol Wara One licenses, uh, even though um, Nautilus uh, sort of went bankrupt and dissolved in 2019, um, as these kind of licenses come up for review. Uh, and you also have had recently in 2022, the Cook Islands approve three domestic 
um, exploration licenses. So still very much in the process of, of being assembled. Sorry. Back to okay, Matt, so there's just one one <laughs> concluding slide, so we can we can wrap up quickly. Um, so yeah, Apologies. so it's, uh, in the chapter and and today we've made we've made two main arguments. Uh, firstly, that deep sea minerals are quintessentially liminal. At different times in different places, they've teetered on the verge of becoming resources, but have thus far remained provisional. And the story of the nodules is particularly illustrative of this, having been the subject of two distinct phases of resource making. Um, and we've also argued that the ontological politics of the Pacific uh, deep sea mining frontier have been shaped by their, both by the material properties of the mineral deposits and those of their deep sea envi environments and their social construction, and that these two things are, are inseparable. So the, the findings affirm that materiality matters in struggles over resource making. Um, and also that indigenous specific ontologies of the ocean are likely to remain of central importance to the fate of the global deep sea mining frontier. And if you'd like to learn more, I encourage you to uh, have a look at our chapter, which is open access. But yeah, ap apologies, Chair, for um, going over time quite significantly. Oh, that's right. I didn't even realise I was so involved in the presentation. <laughs> I should have called earlier, but that's a fantastic presentation. Thank you, Randy. Thank you.